The evidence at a crime scene always tells a story. Forensic scientists interpret that story. What they see in the lab and what they say in court can decide a defendant's fate. But what if they get it wrong? From arson to ballistics, we put forensics under the microscope and ask the question, just how reliable is forensic science? The 23rd of December, 1991. Fire destroyed a house in a small town about an hour southeast of Dallas. The blaze killed three young girls, one-year-old twins Cameron and Carmen Willingham, and their two-year-old sister Amber. The only survivor was the girl's father, 23-year-old Cameron Todd Willingham. He told police that he'd been asleep when the fire started and that his wife was out Christmas shopping. He insisted that he'd done everything he could to save his children. But the forensics told a very different story. At the scene, fire investigators found signs of foul play. Irregular burn patterns on the floor, evidence that someone used an accelerant, such as petrol or lighter fluid, to set the house on fire. And so-called crazed glass, an indication that the blaze burned unnaturally fast and hot. One by one, the clues stacked up convincing investigators that this fire was arson, not the tragic accident Cameron Todd Willingham claimed it was. Armed with this and other evidence, police arrested Willingham for the murder of his three daughters. In August 1992, he was convicted and sentenced to death. Twelve years later, on the 17th of February 2004, he was executed at the age of 36. Willingham's execution might have passed with little notice, had it not been for one thing. During his time on death row, every piece of forensic evidence used to convict him came under question. Today, a growing chorus contends that the case of Cameron Todd Willingham is a story of myth masquerading as science of forensics gone horribly wrong. To understand why the Willingham case has become so controversial, we must first be clear what forensics is and what it isn't. Forensic science is the application of science to the law, everything from fingerprints to DNA analysis. It's a cornerstone of the criminal justice system. In the United States, crime labs process evidence in more than a million new cases annually. But in recent years, many have begun to question whether forensic science is actually good science. It's a full frontal attack on a field that managed to stay immune to criticism and close scrutiny for most of its past. The special agent must have constantly before him the fact that science is a bulwark for criminal investigation. In the 1930s, FBI director J. Edgar Hoover helped stamp American culture with a powerful faith in science as a crime-fighting tool. If that's blood, the chemical reaction will form a vivid blue. It does. The experts testify and the murderer is sentenced to electrocution. But law enforcement adopted forensic techniques such as fingerprint analysis and ballistics before they were scientifically validated. Since the only people using these techniques were the forensic experts themselves, there was little incentive to go back and test their reliability. That was especially true in the field of fire investigation. Around 7% of all building fires that occur in the US are either arson or suspected arson. But for years, theories about arson were passed down the ranks without being questioned. 
These rules of thumb were the forensics that led to Cameron Todd Willingham's conviction, a conviction that even some leading fire experts now believe was wrong. I've read all of the testimony of the experts in that case. None of it is credible. John Lentini has investigated nearly 2,500 fires in his 30-year career. He says the investigators in the Willingham case relied on tradition rather than fact to reach their conclusions. I don't attribute any bad motives to these guys. I think they truly believed it was an arson fire because that's what they had been taught. This videotape, shot by the investigators a week after the blaze, shows a prime example of what Lentini calls BS, bad science. These are what fire investigators refer to as pore patterns, irregular burning often found on the floor at a fire scene. They're called pore patterns because they supposedly show the charred area where the perpetrator poured the accelerant, the ignitable liquid used to get the blaze burning. But are such patterns really proof of arson? The answer, it appears, is no. For decades, investigators assumed that because heat rises and fire burns up, the floor shouldn't burn at all, unless it has help. But scientific research shows that a fire inside a room plays by its own set of rules. These so-called compartment fires do burn upwards, but when they hit the ceiling, they start to burn back down. The result is a commonly occurring phenomenon that can cause the floor to catch fire, along with everything else in the room. This phenomenon is known as flashover. Flashover is a transition phase where you go from having a fire in a room to having a room on fire. That's the simplest way to put it. This test burn demonstrates how flashover occurs. The fire gives off hot gases, which rise in a plume above the flames. When these gases hit the ceiling, they spread out, forming a layer across the top of the room. Fed by the intensifying blaze, the hot gas layer grows thicker and soon has nowhere to expand but downwards. It descends in an even line, absorbing even more heat as it goes. When it hits a temperature of around 600 degrees Celsius, the gas itself becomes hot enough to ignite any exposed combustible surface in the room. If you look across into the bottom left area, you'll see an ottoman there that's beginning to exude gases. Uh, it's beginning to break down chemically and release fuel, and you'll see that ignite just from the amount of heat that's imparted on it from the gas layer in the top. Flashover is the moment when everything in the room that can be on fire is on fire, including the floor. After that, the flames become chaotic, turbulent, and the temperature in the room can reach a thousand degrees. The burn patterns this leaves on the floor look just like those produced by a liquid accelerant. In all likelihood, what the investigators in the Willingham case called poor patterns were nothing more than the after effects of flashover, not proof of arson. All of fire investigation is really about the fire living up to the investigator's expectations of a normal fire. The fire won't lie to you, but it sure as heck can be misinterpreted. Poor patterns aren't the only arson myth the Willingham investigators cited. Another is what is known as crazed glass. Crazing is a web-like pattern of cracks often found on glass at a fire scene. For decades, fire investigators believed that only rapid heating could cause glass to craze. So when they found crazed glass at a fire scene, they assumed it was evidence that someone had used an accelerant to get the fire burning quickly. John Lentini subscribed to this theory until a terrible wildfire inspired him to put it to the test. October 1991. A raging brush fire swept across the hills above Oakland, California. 
The blaze killed 25 people and consumed more than 3,000 homes. It was just a huge tragedy. But being a forensic scientist, I'm a little bit of a buzzard. And I saw this as an opportunity to study the baseline